Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, this month, advanced study class is on Gilbert Welch's new book, Less Medicine, More Health. I'm a great fan of Gilbert Welch. He's been speaking out for years about um, over-treating people, misuse of diagnostic tests. And in this particular book, he talks about the seven myths that drive people to be over-diagnosed and over-treated that, um, that really people should think about. Things like, it's always better to get more information, not, which sounds like a great idea, but when you hear him talk about it, actually not so much. So anyway, I've got, as usual, detailed slide presentations, and if you can be on the conference calls live, that's great. If not, we have the recordings, and soon we are gonna have videotapes of each of these um, posted online so you can watch the videos anytime. Won't that be cool? All right, the other thing, conference registration. I know that November seems like it is really far off, but if you were gonna to come to Columbus and spend three or four days with us in November, you probably have to start planning right now. So uh, we already have a lot of people registered. We have a capacity here, so you do wanna get your registration in early, and we have an all-star lineup. You can go to wellnessforum.com, and you'll see the conference information is posted right there. I think when you see these speakers, you'll get very interested in coming and being part of our weekend. And it gets more expensive every month, so you wanna register now instead of later. All right, topics for today. According to a new meta-analysis, medications to treat overactive bladder are virtually useless. And let's talk about what overactive bladder is. By definition, uh, it includes symptoms like urinating eight or more times a day or two or more times a night. And by the way, um, that definition really is a form of disease mongering because a lot of us who drink a lot of water probably do that. But any, in any case, the classic definition is urinating eight or more times a day and two or more times at night, strong and sudden needs to urinate immediately, urine leakage or incontinence. So under normal circumstances, the way things are supposed to work, the kidneys produce urine, which then travels to the bladder. And when the bladder is full, nerve signals sent to the brain trigger an urge to urinate. And then during urination, the muscles of the pelvic floor relax and the muscles of the bladder tighten and that helps to push out the urine. Well, when you have overactive bladder, the muscles of the bladder contract even though the bladder is not full and create this urgent uh, need to urinate. A lot of different causes and, and part of the problem with dealing with it from a pharmaceutical perspective is not really taking into consideration all the different ways in which this can happen. So I'll give you a short list here. Neurological disorders like Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis, poor kidney function, diabetes, medications that can cause an increase in urine production, tumors, bladder stones, organ prolapse uh, due to pregnancy and childbirth, factors that lead to symptoms of incontinence like urinary tract infections and constipation, high caffeine, high alcohol intake. So um, it's kind of difficult to come up with one pill that addresses all of those things, although the money is in coming up with one pill. Medicine likes that simplistic yet expensive approach. Women are more likely to develop overactive bladder than men. Now, there are a lot of non-pharmaceutical options for treating overactive bladder, which are never shown on the TV commercials promoting the drugs, of course. Kegel exercises, which can strengthen the muscles of the pelvic floor, uh, resolving the health issues. I mean, if you have two type, type 2 diabetes, you don't take Mirvatric. You resolve the type 2 diabetes, right? Reducing caffeine and alcohol, improvement of neurological symptoms through diet and lifestyle intervention. I've talked a lot and written about uh, the relationship between diet and multiple sclerosis for example, weight loss, bladder training, and actually there's a very specialized form of physical therapy that works for this as well. But of course, drugs have become the preferred treatment. And if you watch television, you know, a, I don't watch a lot of TV, but all you have to do is turn on the television for an hour or two and you get a pretty good idea what everybody in America is suffering from because you see all the ads for the drugs to treat it. And so a lot of people are being told that if they go to the bathroom a lot, they have overactive bladder disease and they should go to their doctor for pharmaceutical intervention. But drug comp uh, drugs commonly used to treat overactive bladder are not very effective, include, and this is due to, or the results from, a meta-analysis that included 50 randomized controlled trials, 98% of which were paid for by the companies that make the drugs. Now, even with bias involved, because they paid for it, all these, um, these, these meta, the meta-analysis shows that the drugs are useless. In fact, when compared to placebo, they barely offer any advantage at all. And the one that's currently being um, uh, marketed heavily is Mirbetric. That's the one that you see on TV all the time. 
And in addition to not being very effective, uh, the drugs cause side effects. Now, for Mirbetrek, the most commonly advertised one, um, side effects include increased blood pressure, urinary retention, inflammation of nasal passages, dry mouth constipation, and loss of cognitive function. Um, it seems to me that some of these non-pharmaceutical options would be more attractive to people if they saw the poor efficacy rates and the side effects associated with these silly drugs. And therein lies the problem, by the way. When people talk, I know that there are the side effects are listed really quickly in the, uh, in the ad, but nonetheless, people call their medical doctors to get prescriptions for these drugs. And if medical doctors would sit down with patients and say, look, I can write a prescription for this drug, but before I do, I just want you to look over here. First of all, these are the side effects. Now here's the efficacy rate. Not so good. Over here are six or seven or eight other things we could try that are more effective and don't cause those side effects. What would you like to do? I've always said that one of the reasons why I lost my mother is that I was telling her that she should do things differently, but the guys in the white coats weren't telling her that she should do things differently. So put a lot of responsibility for that on the medical profession. All right, so now this other study that I want to talk about today um, is really interesting and not surprising based on the world I live in, but I think you can't get enough of this type of evidence with all the discussion about the myths associated with diet that go on all the time. So according to this new study, reducing dietary fat causes people to lose more body fat than reducing carbohydrate intake. Go figure, right? Lead author Kevin Hall presented his findings at a 2015 meeting of the Endocrine Society, and he commented during a press briefing that one of his observations about the diet industry is there always is a macronutrient being blamed for obesity. And today, carbohydrate bashing is in, so that's what made him inspired to do some research. So actually the study design was interesting. Researchers enrolled 19 non-diabetic patients who were obese. Their average body mass index was 36. And they were housed at a National Institutes of Health facility for, a two, -week, uh, for two two week inpatient stays. For five days, all participants ate a baseline diet that was comprised of 50% carbohydrate, 25%, 35% fat, and 15% protein, calculated to be calorically adequate for the patient's needs. Then they were randomized to two groups. Both groups reduced their calorie intake by 30% or 800 calories a day. One group reduced fat intake, while the other group ate a reduced carbohydrate diet. And the research, uh, researchers provided all the food. The subjects did not have to make any choices. And that's really terrific because it's controlled. Um, everybody ate the same amount of calories, the same amount of food, uh, calorie reduction, etc. Well, after a washout period, subjects returned to the facility. They did another five-day baseline diet. Then they switched places. So the low-carb people became low-fat eaters. The low-fat people became low-carb eaters, etc. And here's what happened. Reduced fat diet resulted in an 80% greater loss of body fat than the reduced carbohydrate diet. That's, about, that's pretty huge, I would say. Limitations of the study, of course, included short duration, and Dr. Hall stated that he wasn't sure that the low-fat diet would be effective in the long term or that people would adhere to it. Well, fortunately, this study may not have looked at adherence and long-term results, but lots of others have, including population studies that show that uh, people who live on a lower-fat diet consistently, like the Okinawans, have very low risk of disease, maintain normal body weight, Etc. And of course, Dr. Esselstyn's research showed that patients are remarkably compliant. I mean, his 29 year data that was published last summer showed 90% compliance rate. So I think we have some evidence that people will follow the diet if they're explained, if it's explained to them why they should do it and they're shown how to do it. And of course, I always come back to when you're looking at a study like this. To a certain extent, this whole thing is a math issue, and I don't want people to count calories and all that sort of thing. That's not where I'm going with this, but you know, fat has nine calories per gram, and carbohydrate has four calories per gram. So if you're gonna reduce something, it just makes sense. Reduce the nine calorie per gram <laughs> macronutrient, you're probably gonna have better results. I think sometimes just using that common sense approach is just too simple, I suppose, or you know, people don't wanna hear about it. But in any case, this study quite clear. Reducing fat, much more effective than reducing carbohydrate. Okay, that's all for today. Have a great couple days, and I'll speak with you again on Thursday.